this contract's hypothetical is a straight UCC problem, and the issues presented in this question are commonly tested on the multi-state, and they come up on the essays as well. Take a look at the call of the question. Here, really, the last couple of short paragraphs constitute the call. Clark sued Jones for breach of contract in state court, seeking damages based on the original 50-cent price for the remaining 50,000 pens. What arguments should each party make, and how should the case be decided? Discuss. Well, we can organize a fairly thoughtful answer to this question before we even read the fact pattern. We know that the plaintiff's theory of liability arises out of breach of contract, and we've got a pretty clear idea that this is a case involving merchants and the UCC. So we'll deal with formation, defenses to formation, breach, defenses to breach, remedies, defenses to remedies. That's the basic analytical framework that we bring to the question just by reading the call. We go to the top of the question, and we see that this is a fairly complicated UCC problem but it doesn't really appear to be a formation problem. In paragraph 1, we see that Jones orders pens from Clark. It's obvious in paragraph 1 that both of these parties are merchants under the UCC. And take a look at paragraph 2, and we see an acceptance. But look carefully. We see that this acceptance contains an additional clause, and that's an arbitration clause. And we know that contract formation under the UCC is a lot more loose than it is under the common law. So here, a mirror image acceptance isn't required the way it would be under the common law. Under the common law, this reply could well be considered a further negotiation rather than an acceptance, or a refusal combined with a new offer. But here, under the UCC, this is an acceptance with a new term. Now, the issue becomes whether or not this new term becomes a part of the agreement. Nowhere in the facts do we read that there is an objection to this new term. So a fairly persuasive argument can be reached, could be made, that this case belongs in arbitration as a result of the lack of objection to Clark's written acceptance with this additional arbitration clause. Now, one could argue that this is such a material change in the relationship between the parties that it should not be allowed to come into the contract without some specific discussion, that this clause ought to be severed from the contract. Personally, I think perhaps the stronger argument is that the case should be arbitrated. Now, look at paragraph 3. Here we have what appears to be a modification made in bad faith. Here, the, the, Jones telephones Clark and basically says, our deal's off unless you lower the price. But look at the end of the paragraph. Clark grudgingly accepted. Now, this guy is a merchant. He accepts this change. And furthermore, in the very first line of the next paragraph, he accepts the lower payment. So it looks to me as if there's really no question about the fact that the modification with regard to the purchase price is valid. Now, suppose this seller had taken a different tack. Suppose he'd said, I'm not going to modify the price. You go ahead and make your other deal, and I'll sue you for damages under the UCC because the profits calculable on a purchase and sale of fungible goods like pens is so easy to calculate, it would be no problem for the plaintiff to pursue a damages remedy. But instead, he doesn't want to lose the sale. He doesn't want to have to resort to going to court, so he grudgingly agrees, and then he accepts payment. And that's enough to stop him from denying the validity of this modification. So thinking ahead, assuming this guy's actually got a decent claim for damages, those damages are likely to be based on the lower price because not only did he accept that modification, but he partially performed with the lower price. Next, we find that the candidate for office, that is the subject matter of this order of pens, drops out of the race. And then the buyer contacts the seller saying, I no longer want to go through with this deal at all. Now, we have to look carefully at the discussion of the contract itself. Look at the written confirmation. In the confirmation, the seller acknowledges the purpose of the agreement. So the seller's on notice that this is a political campaign. And I think it's entirely foreseeable to both parties 
that a political candidate might drop out of the race before Election Day. And if that happens, the purpose of this contract would be thwarted, and it would be entirely reasonable for the buyer to back out of the contract without expecting to face any liability for a breach. So we get the call of the question again, and we see that we're going to be talking about formation, modification, and we'll be talking about breach, ultimately reaching a conclusion with regard to the rights and liabilities of the parties. So turn the page and take a look at the outline of issues that I've presented for this very straightforward UCC problem. Again, I'm telling you you'll see fact patterns strikingly similar to this in practice and on the real multi-state bar exam. This is a classic question presenting very standard issues in a strikingly standard way. So the first thing we need to do is discuss whether or not we've got a contract. That means discussing offer and acceptance and consideration. Clearly all of these are present, but the most complicated issue with regard to formation is the arbitration clause. Does the arbitration clause become a part of this contract or not? I think a persuasive argument can be made either way. Perhaps the arbitration clause is too extreme to be made a part of the contract. By extreme, I mean it changes the relationship of the parties too much for it to be allowed into the agreement, that it goes beyond the scope of what we imagine a standard non-mirror image acceptance under the UCC ought to look like. On the other hand, there's no objection to this new clause. That might be enough to constitute a waiver, and then the arbitration clause would be enforced. But here, we don't really get to choose. We can go on to analyze the issues regardless of whether or not the case ultimately is arbitrated. We'll reach a conclusion one way or another. But we've still got to analyze the real issues between the parties, which is liability and damages. So we turn to the modification issue. The price has been cut from 50 cents to 45 cents a unit as a result of a phone call that looks rather like a bad faith extortion attempt, where the buyer says, drop the price or I'm breaching. But this is a UCC contract between merchants. The seller voluntarily, grudgingly, agreed to reduce the purchase price. And not only that, but Clark accepted the payment from Jones, and as a result, the deal is complete. And there is no possibility that this modification can really be disputed by the seller. The seller accepted full payment. So the modification likely will be binding on both parties. Now, we next consider the issue of breach. Jones canceled the second half of the order. And unless Jones has some justification or excuse for canceling the deal, he's going to be on the hook at least for the lost profits on the deal. But the underlying subject matter of the campaign was the political of the contract was the political campaign of the candidate Davis. Davis dropped out of the race and here there are a couple of important facts that you've got to be aware of. Notice that the candidate dropped out of the race before Clark ordered the next order of pens from the manufacturer. So to the extent that the seller can claim damages for breach those damages would only be measured on the basis of profit, not on the basis of the inventory itself. And we know that Clark had notice of the underlying nature of the agreement because Clark acknowledged as much in the acceptance uh, earlier in our analysis. So next we turn to defenses to breach. And those breaches are frustration of purpose and impractic uh, impracticability. And clearly, the underlying purpose of this contract has been frustrated. And not only that, but it's been frustrated in precisely the way that both parties were well aware would be possible. So my conclusion, based on the analysis that I've just suggested, is that the cancellation of the second order by Jones is not a breach of contract. And so Clark has no claim against Jones for that other deal. Now we turn to considering the real conclusions, the bottom lines in this case. We see that Jones' cancellation of the second half of the order was justified, so the plaintiff isn't entitled to any remedies at all. But, assuming arguendo that the plaintiff did have a claim, that claim would only be based on the lost profits from a purchase and sale with the 45 cent per unit purchase price. Why? Because the earlier modification was accepted, 
and was fully performed with regard to the first set, set of pens. So if there is liability for the second set of pens, that liability will be calculated based on lost profits at the lower purchase price. Ultimately, I find that the defendant's commercial frustration defense is an excuse that excuses his performance and justifies a finding on the part of the defense. So let's take a look at it for a moment at what we've just considered. This is a complicated UCC problem. It's complicated, but as we dissect it together, we see that it's really quite straightforward. Either this case goes into arbitration or it doesn't. There are persuasive arguments on either side. But with regard to damages, it's quite apparent that there is a correct answer. Both of these parties knew about the underlying nature of this deal. Both of these parties knew it was a political campaign, and both parties could reasonably foresee the candidate would drop out. So with regard to the second half of this contract, the defendant's failure to perform is excused by commercial frustration of purpose, and the plaintiff isn't entitled to remedies. If he were entitled to remedies, they would be a damages remedy calculated on the basis of the modified price. As always, I think you'll see that practicing these problems sharpens your knowledge of the law in a way that mere studying never will.